Kia ora koutou. welcome to South Pacific Scott. Muscle. Uh, tonight we have got a guest who's uh, locked away in a hotel in Auckland, unfortunately, but on a positive note, we're getting him back in New Zealand. So one of the three mics, we've got uh, Mike Debenham. Welcome along, Mike Debenham. Cheers, guys. Thanks for having us on. No worries. Hey, look, um, before we kick off into it, how's the whole isolation thing treating you, man? You're, you're out pretty soon, I hear? Uh, yeah, we get out on Tuesday, so I've been in here almost two weeks. So it's actually, to be honest, um, we're in the Grand Mercure in the middle of uh, middle of Auckland, and it really you couldn't you couldn't really ask it to be any better. To be honest, it's um, you know the food's reasonable and so it's fantastic, but it's you know it's 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 you know fine. Um, you know the, the rooms are very very comfortable. You know if I was up here for a weekend, it would be definitely a nice place to be staying. It's been locked up for for two weeks. Is a little bit. Yeah. It wears a little bit thin. <laughs> so what's... how's the uh, how's the COVID test? Is that uncomfortable? They doing the nasal swab for you? Uh, yeah, it's 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 good. Oh, oh, yeah, we've done we've done a couple of the nasal swabs. I won't give you a wee scan around the room because my wife's lying in bed watching TV. She wouldn't have a shower. <laughs> She's having showers at like four thirty in the afternoon and getting into her pajamas at four thirty in the afternoon, uh, yeah. which isn't bad considering we're not getting out of bed about our last eight. So. Um, yeah, but no, the rooms are the rooms are very comfortable, uh, much more comfortable than the swabs, that's for sure. <laughs> but oh, I did actually, I did actually have a swab when I was in Australia um, uh, back about a month ago, so uh, I, I have I have experienced it before. Oh God! Well, at least you'll be refreshed after all that sleep, and uh, when you hit the ground, Christchurch, you'll hit the ground running. Yeah, hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, mate. Yeah. Hey, um, look uh, for those that um, haven't followed your career. Um, I know a bit about it because I um, was fortunate enough to spend some time training in your gym down at uh, World Gym down in Christchurch, which is a fantastic yeah. gym, had a great vibe. Um, and I know you sort of started off as a, as a league player, um, yep. quite a ha- handy league player, I believe. So do you want to give us a bit of a rundown of your um, your sporting history and how you got into bodybuilding and, and, yeah. and then a bit of chronological order of some of the competing that you've done over the years? Yeah, Absolutely. So um, I sort of first uh, started, get, I suppose, doing a bit of training with weights when I was about 14 or 15. Um, and I actually just started off with one of my really good friends, uh, Tony Tibbetts, who was my captain of my league team at the time. And um, I, I wasn't too bad at league. I was, I was, I was pretty handy, but I was, I was small. Yeah. So uh, my biggest thing was I just wanted to put more weight on for, um, so I was, uh, wasn't getting banged around by some of the big island boys as much, to be honest. <laughs> um, and then I think, I suppose, then it sort of progressed because... Um, you know, I was in a very good rugby league team as well. So um, we were always in grand finals and, and so forth. So very competitive. And then I, I just started to enjoy probably doing things at my own pace and relying on myself um, for success, not necessarily a team. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, I then started um, deciding that I wanted to jump up on stage. So um, I actually went to a very well-known Christchurch multiple Mr. New Zealand and told him I wanted to be a bodybuilder. I won't use his name. Um, and said, I'd like to look like one of the, like, like those guys over there. And I, I think I pointed to a couple of guys that were probably about 90 kilos that I thought looked massive. Um, and he actually laughed at me and said, you'll never look like that. So that's the reason I won't use his name. But um, um, yeah, can we, one of the can we other... just say that can we just say that guys like that are fucking wankers? Because I think that's the most arrogant, shitty thing to say to anyone that's got a because <laughs> you know anyone with a with a hope and a dream and a big set of fucking balls, um, will will you know will get there. Yeah, and... look, I, I think I think eventually, as we obviously we got down get down the story, I think he he probably ate his words. Um, I, well, he actually ate his he actually ate his words after the first competition because another um, a guy in the, in the gym, a guy called Les Millen, who was my first coach and someone who I still keep in contact with, you know, even though I was only eighteen, and me and Les still talk on on Facebook and all that sort of stuff. Um, he took me on, um, and he was actually at the time dating. Um, this is a few names going back back from the past, but he was actually dating Bern Worrell at the time, which was Ann Polachek's daughter. So there's um, Ann Polachek was an ex Miss, Miss New Zealand. Vern was a junior Miss Miss New Zealand. I think she believe I believe she won. So Les took me on, and um, from that, that my first competition, I actually beat out the um, um, the then teenage Mister New Zealand, um, Damien Porter. So um, yeah, so that was sort of my first my first time on stage, and everyone was saying, you know, don't expect too much. Damien Porter's going to be there. <laughs> Damien Porter, oh, yeah, okay. So I, I didn't expect anything. I ended up coming away with the win. 
um, and that particular trainer that told me that I was never going to get there um, was then interviewed because it was his competition that he was running. Uh, and all of a sudden, I had a big aspira, I had a big future in front of me. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I got named in the paper as, as someone that was as up and coming and having a big future. So, um, so that was sort of my kickoff, and that was back in 1993. So then, um, so 93, I competed again in 94. Uh, so I won the South Islands that, that year um, and then went to the Nationals. I think I got about sixth at the Nationals in 93. And I think, I'm pretty sure, uh, Mike Kingsnorth was at the Nationals as well, which, of course, me and Mike are very, very good mates. Yeah. Um, and then 94, I, um, I competed again, uh, defended my junior title, went to the Nationals, um, got third at the Nationals, which I was very, very happy with because I was up against some big names and and back then um, I was very green um, in my approach to bodybuilding um, and then I think you know things just sort of spot went, went from there and my next step was to move into you know back then it was you did one class so you did juniors and then you got to then you you know if you felt like you did all right you go to novices and then and go to open none of this I'm going to go to a show and do juniors years novice and open you know yeah. walk away with three trophies it was like you had your one shot on cha- on stage and that was it you gave it gave it a good old crack so my my goal at that point was um not to walk up on stage in the novice class until i felt that i was good enough to be an open athlete yep. um so 1997 was my next time up on stage and that's when actually i, I, I can attest, against each other. I can attest that uh, you were good enough to be in the open yeah because you actually won the overall well, for that didn't you i ended up winning the overall so i won the novice yeah heavyweights and then they put me in the overalls which was a little bit they didn't normally do that and I was up against actually Mark Anderson and Paul Wood uh, and I actually beat those guys um, hey, to win the overall South Islands. Thank you for mentioning that name Paul Wood. I, I was trying to remember his name the other day because that guy used to come in like he was just like cement with veins on. Yeah he, yeah absolutely. Uh, he was um, he, miles ahead of his time and just a phenomenal like just just brick hard and I always remember he was a standard that I used to look at because conditioning was off the hook. Yeah, because the '97 show, funnily enough, was uh, Mike and my first show, the South Islands, and um, I, I've told the story before. But I went to the South Islands after seeing about four or five shows in North Island, convinced I was going to win in the novices, and came six in my class. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think we seemed to quietly and down the South Island just go about our go about our business. Mm-hmm. I think and yeah. just and we had some we had some amazing people down the South Island through that early mid nineties, and yeah. you know, and a couple of those uh, still, uh, you know. Steve Lynch is still a very, very good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he, he became one of my mentors. And I think he, he spent some time down Dunedin, down at, um, uh, down at the gyms down there. Um, we had, yep. yeah, yeah, that Powdown, that's right. We had Vaughan Patterson, yeah, who again yeah. became a very, very good friend. Um, so, you know, and, you know and I, at that, around that time, I became good friends with Dave Smith as well. So I, I'm going to be really honest, around that mid-90s and that, that late 90s when... I suppose I started to come into my own because after 97, I won the, also won the New Zealand novice heavyweight title. Yep. And then that's when I went into the opens and started doing very well. Mm-hmm. But I had, I had some really good people around me. Some re- and, you know, and, 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 and I put a lot of my success down to the fact that people I had around me. Yeah, it was a, it was a real solid era. Um, and I mean, even, yeah, was it, uh, who was the guy, Flynn, that was in the same... Yeah, Jamie Flynn. Jamie so, because, yep. yeah, at that, at that point, and you remember this because you were at that gym, we yep. had... You know, I had Will Jim Christ, uh, Will Jim Christchurch at the yeah. time. We had was it Matt? Um, Matt? Big, Big, Matt Ashworth. Big Matt Ashworth. Yep. Yeah, so Big yeah. Matt Ashworth worked for me. We had um, we had Carmen Cotter, who was Carmen. you know was the only only pro and yeah. female pro in the country, and and she got second at the Gentana. So her first outing was was a was a really big you know entrance. We had Dave Smith training there. We had um, Lisa um, Lisa. Masson training, yeah. Mas- oh, training there. Masson training there. We had Vaughan Patterson. We had had Steve Lynch. We, you know, you and Greg when he was down in, t- in t- yeah. town would always train there. You know, so we had some phenomenal. We had Jamie Flynn. We had Daniel Hibbs. Daniel you know, Hibbs, we had, yeah. and, and they were all at World Gym. And half those names I mentioned either worked for me or were members of my gym. Mm. So you know, we had we had a, a, an amazing atmosphere. Yeah. An amazing atmosphere. Yeah. So can I just yeah. tell you my recollection of that show because. Nathan said that when he turned up, he was sure he was going to win. When I turned up and got backstage, I don't know if I was looking at the other athletes. I might have just been looking at you, but I went, 
oh my God, what am I doing here? Can I just leave? Do I have to go out on stage? Can I just sneak out the back? And there was 10 guys in our class and I was, I was sure I was coming last and I ended up coming second to you. Uh, yeah. It was a fairly close thing, you know, but coming second to you, you went out and won the overall. So if uh, yep. it was another year, I might have, might have snuck away with that title. So, <laughs> But, but two years later, came back to, to win that title. But that's luck of the draw because there was only four in it then and they were all rubbish. Oh, sorry, I should say that. But uh, relatively speaking, um, anybody could have walked in and won that. So in the, the year in between was Matt Ashworth. So yeah. know, it's, it's just yep. kind of luck of the draw. But that, um, I just remember looking at you just going, oh, my God, is that what I'm up against? Well, I, I was only weighing about 83 kilos back then. Um, I was 102. But I'm six foot yeah. two, so. But um, but I, I I think back back in those days, I mean, I not that I didn't, I haven't dieted hard since, but I had, I just had a probably, I suppose back then it was ve- you were purely reliant on your hard work and nothing else, mm. and so you just had to come. Like for me, not being a big a big guy and a big big stature guy, I mean, I, I've got quite small joints. I just had to come and absolutely peeled, mm. and I think through those couple of years in those that late late nineties, that was always probably my strength was I would come in um, you know, proportionate wise I know I was I was um, you know, I, I suppose I had a, a nice shape, but I was never the biggest guy, but I just made sure I bought everything in really tight and symmetrical. And I think that's probably what held me over in my not in my 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 amateur early amateur years was just that, okay, he's got shape and he's conditioned. I was never ever the biggest on stage. Um, and I think for a lot of people, that sort of also at that time was saying to people, you don't have to be the biggest guy on stage. You just got to bring it all together. And I remember the, you doing the, doing the splits and the your posing sp- routine. I was just going to say that the splits and That's the right. uh, Terminator routine. Actually, good. I put a photo of it. Yeah. yeah. I, I actually put a photo of doing that splits on, um, on Instagram the other day. Yeah. Um, and you know, the one routine I can't find anywhere on DVD or video is that Terminator routine, which really pisses me off because that was, I reckon, still probably the best routine I've ever done. And I cannot, it's the one, yeah. it's the one video I cannot find anywhere. I think over the years I linked out VHSs to people and they've, you know, they've never returned. And yeah, yeah. So I'm a bit gutted so, that I don't have that one on video. So, in, so I'm just throwing it out there. If anyone's got, anyone's got that routine on video, get hold of me. And if anyone hasn't, Mike, uh, what about 221? Someone brings back the Terminator routine. <laughs> I just don't think I'd be too good with the splits anymore. Oh, jeepers. Yeah, no, that was, that, that, that was something, you know, a memory, you know, I've got a, a bunch of memories that I remember and, and that and come and caught a rear lap spread with, with some of the memories from that show that I just went, that stuck in my head for, you know, yeah, what a show. So, yeah, um, yeah so, so post, post, post that, where'd you go from there? Um, so post that, so that, so we were talking around that 97, 98, I came back. Um, so I did, in 98, I did the, also did the Pan Pacifics as a novice in my last year, um, as a novice, because, you, you know, you get that 12 months to compete as a novice. I know at, at that, at that uh, show, myself and Graham Caldwell were training together. So me and Graham went up yeah. to, to do that show together. Graham actually bet Justin, with Justin Reese, big Kiwi. Yep. Um, and um, I'm trying to actually think of the judge's name. He was trying to encouraged me to go into the opens but I think back then like I said you had that no I'll, I want to work the ranks I want to do things right so that was my last shot as a, as a novice I won the Pan Pacific heavyweight title um, I think I bet um, I bet Philly Nithu for that title actually um, and then that later that year went into the opens obviously won the South Island title again won the uh, Light heavy Mr. New Zealand title. Uh, we'll carry on moving on from that story. Moving on. So I won the 98 Mr. New yeah. Zealand title, uh, won the 99 Taranaki heavyweights, won the 2000 overall heavyweight and overall Mr. New Zealand. And then um, and then sort of had a bit of a break for a little while and actually went off and did some stuff with Nava. Um, and that was a bit of a, because there was a, let's say some um, disagreements to the way things were getting run with the NZFBB back then through yeah. it with. Um, with uh, some of the some of the judges and what they were trying to get, achieve with the IFBB, I suppose. Um, and Nabba did the 2006, no, 2003 missed the universe. I got sixth there. 2005 did the Worlds, got fifth at the Worlds. And that was the, what I think now is, because it's, it's changed a bit since I've left New yeah. Zealand, but I think that was Nabba New Zealand. You know, they had the breakaway and, you know, so. And then... I got approached actually by the IFBB 
um, to start running the South Island title uh, champs in 2005. And then I had that period from 2005 through to uh, 2010 or 2011 until me and my wife moved to Australia where I was actually running the IFBB in the South Island. Yep. Um, and yeah, that's when I was, there was a few times where I was guest posing, judging, running the show. <laughs> <laughs> and try to manage about ten people on stage as well. So she was a pretty, pretty hectic old time. Yeah, but I always, was, uh, I always, always excuse myself from the judging table when my athletes were on stage. So well, when you got fifteen athletes in a show, you can't even judge too many classes. <laughs> no, no. In fact, when I, when I, when I was running the South Island Champs, most of the time I didn't actually sit on the judging table. I was actually. I opted to run the backstage for that very reason. I was just too close to too many of the athletes. So um, you generally find me running around the backstage, making sure everything was um, yeah, running so on two, time. 2007 was when uh, we came We came back in the country in 2006. My wife wanted to compete again as she went to the yep. Never, And we were up in Christchurch. And I, I think we were just watching the show. And I saw you across the way. And I recognise you. And I, mean, I won't remember me. But I remember you coming over and having a quick chat and telling me you were... I don't know, guest posing and judging and all these clients in the show and running the show and that sort of thing. And I was just super impressed with how relaxed you were because if I was doing all of that, I'd just be, my head would be exploding. I, I'd actually tell you, in 2007, what happened, I wasn't going to compete. I was going to do the Taranakis in 2007, uh, 2007 to qualify for the 2008 Nationals. Yeah, you know, the Taranakis always behind the, behind the Nationals by one week. That's the first qualifier. And Paul Wood was competing. And this is the one time. This is the one time that I actually had. I I didn't win my class, and I, Paul was having a bit of a moan the fact that he was going to be getting up on stage by himself, and there was no one to compete against, and putting all that effort as a heavyweight open. I get that, and I actually decided two days before the show, and I was five weeks out from the Taranakis. So I said, oh, "Fuck it, I'll just chuck some tan on and jump <laughs> up on stage," and, and and I knew he was going to beat me because he always comes in peeled, and if you're going to beat, beat Paul Wood, you've got to be in shape. And um, I was out of shape and we had a great time on stage and you know, we really did. And like, he deserved every win. And, um, and, uh, and I, you know, I had no problems with getting second to him. But fuck, I hated it. Anyway, by, I think about <laughs> nine, nine o'clock on Sunday morning, I'd gone and spent 600 bucks on a spin bike, put it in the lounge and I rang up the, um, I rang up, um, uh, I think it was Mark Stewart at the time and said, I'm not, I'm not judging the nationals because I'm competing. <laughs> And I went, I've got to beat Paul Wood again, which I ended up winning the Nationals in 2007. So the, that, the light that, year, that year that we went to the universe, Paul Wood and Mark Anderson both went to the universe with us. That's right. He went to the, they went to the universe yeah. afterwards. Cause, yeah, Paul, like he Paul came wasn't. sixth or so at the universe. Mark won his class. Yep. And it, Parnham won her class. Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Delane won, won her class as well. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was Wood and Everly. So, yeah, so at that point, um, when I won the Nationals in 2007, which I had done things quite differently as far as preparation and the last way, the last three years of my life prior to that was very different. Um, I came in a lot lighter and a lot smaller. And, but, you know, I was, I was very happy with what I was able to achieve um, in that state. Um, and then it was my partner at the time, sort of, I had the options of going to the World Champs in 2008 um, or, or asking for my pro card. And of course, um, and Nathan, as you know, the pro card has always been something that I've always wanted. Yeah. Um, so I had to make a few few decisions, few hard decisions, and I decided to take the pro card and, and then and then move into the pro ranks. So end of, that was the end of the amateurs for me. And then you know, back to the bottom of the pile, getting you know, yeah. getting kicked. Yeah. How did you deal with that? Because we talk, talked about that with um, with a few athletes on, on here, but also I had that conversation with a guy um, that we entered his wedding last week about turning pro and, you know, having been the top for the last couple of years and then all of a sudden... Well, look, I actually thought about this when I knew I was going to talk to you and, and, and I think if anyone that's... Um, in that situation, which is looking to, to come in to become a pro and, and wanting to become a pro. If they don't listen to anything else that we've got to say tonight, I reckon this is probably the thing that, that I, I, I think they should really think about. Is if I had my time over again with the way the IFBB Pro League has changed, when, uh, the IFBB, when I talk about the IFBB Pro League, we're talking about NPC Worldwide as well. Yeah. So the way that's changed now that as an amateur, you can go to any show in the world that you want. You don't have to get anyone's permission. You don't have to ask for Mo's permission. You don't have to ask for anyone's permission. You just get on a plane. Well, when you can get on a plane and you can go. You can go to America and compete. You can go to Australia and compete. You can go to Europe and compete. 
if you're chasing your pro card, what you have to realize is that you're pretty much putting for 99.99999% of us, you are putting your bodybuilding career to, to sleep, to death. Yeah. Um, and the reality is there is a very few people that will ever get their pro card that will make it. Becoming a pro makes life a shitload harder because we're so limited in the, in the competitions we can do. Yeah. Um, if you're already pushing the ante, you're pushing the limits of your health and you know what you you, you morally can handle mm -hmm. to just scrape in by the to, to, by the skin of your teeth to win a national title to get a pro card. I would seriously think twice and go. If I really love bodybuilding and I love competing, just keep having that hitting the amateur stuff. Yep. Um, because you do go to the bottom of the pile and all of a sudden a show, my first pro shows, my first two pro shows, I tore up $25,000 yeah, yeah. You know, um, to go to America and do two shows. Yep. Um, and, you know, and then I, I was, I was at the bottom of the barrel, you know, like I was holding, I wasn't doing too bad. Like mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I got in a comparison of my first pro show with Robert, um, Robert P P Petri Petriwski, or whatever you pronounce his name, yeah, um, yeah. which is the Polish two-time world world champion. He got 15th, and I was in the 16th, because once you get 16th, yeah. Yeah, everyone's 16th. But I was in the... So I know that I was in that middle ground, yeah. but the reality is I love competing, and I love coming up on stage and doing the, robot, the, you know, the Terminator routines and the, the splits and all that sort of stuff, and entertaining my friends and my family and hearing that crowd go nuts. But when you turn, a pro, turn pro and you put all your money and effort into going overseas and competing... Um, and you walk out on stage and there's not one being person out there that who knows who you are, maybe apart from a partner that's traveled with you. Yeah. It's, it's actually pretty lonely. And unless you have, unless you have that, and I, I think this is especially in bodybuilding, I think there's more opportunity with men's physique and, and even classic and definitely in bikini. But when you're talking about bodybuilding, mm. you know, um, it's a it's a hard gig and the shows are so far and few between. So I sort of do say to someone that's 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 been throwing everything at trying to get their pro card for the last five or six years, you know, just think twice about what you want from the sport. Yeah. Because I think um someone made the comment to me for most people getting a pro card is is the end of your bodybuilding career. I think Michael Kingsnorth might have said that to you actually. Yeah. So we've had that conversation a lot. And it is for most people. Yeah. I mean, how many pro cards have been given out and how many if we look at the if we look at means bodybuilding in, in New Zealand and say since the, since two thousand, how many pro cards have been given out and how many people have gone to America and competed? Yeah. In bodybuilding. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about the bikini or the figure or the men's physique or anything, but I talk about men's bodybuilding. Yeah. Because also, if you look at the schedule, men's bodybuilding schedule is this big. Women's bikini is this yeah. big. You can go to the States, and which is when we were over there in, um, in November for Mike and, and Kate's um, show, there were two bikini competitions in California in the same weekend. Wow. So, so you can go there as a bikini athlete and, and spend four weeks there and do four or five shows. Easy. Yeah. Yep. But that's not going to happen as a bodybuilder. So mm -hmm. I, I suppose if you look from 2000 onwards, all the people that have got their pro cards, how many men have actually gone to America and competed mm -hmm. in bodybuilding? It's not many because most mm -hmm. people get their card and then don't use it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think for some people, um, you know, maybe getting the card is like, you know, their swan song. And they're like, I want to get a card. I want to go and do a pro show and then I'll get my boots on. Oh, look, absolutely. And I think, I think that, you know, everyone's different. So that's why I just think you have to ask yourself what, what it is. Because, yeah. I mean, I'm 46 years old now. So, and, you know, I've got a crook shoulder that just doesn't allow me to train the way I would have trained when I was, when I was competing. Yeah. Um, now, if I was an amateur and my shoulder was still holding together, I'd be enjoying my bodybuilding career by going and doing, trying to do masters champs and master, you know, I'd still do the old open show, but I'd go and do some masters world champs. And, and also now you've got all the Arnold's that you could go to and all these other shows you can go to when back when I was trying to get my pro card, which I wasn't even trying to get it in 2007. I was trying to get it in 2000. Yeah. Um, none of that was available to us. Yeah. So I just think there's so much more available for the amateur athlete to see the world stand on big stages without necessarily having to end their career, like you said, by getting their pro card and then finding themselves at the bottom of the barrel and then going, do I want to spend $20,000 to get yeah. 20th? Yep. Yeah. And I think that's probably, you know, the, the fact that we get a pro show here once every 
two years, maybe yep. one, one in Australia. Um, yep. Otherwise, you know, it's just the travel and accommodation, yep. etc. You know, you, you're looking at a big chunk of change that is out of the average person's league before you even worry about the bodybuilding competition. Yeah, yeah, do you, uh, do you think it's a little bit about around marketing for some people? I mean, trainers, oh, look, coaches. I, yeah, look, I think I think so. Um, but, yeah, I definitely think you, you that, and if that's again, if that's part of what you what you're wanting to achieve, I think that that's great. Um, I suppose this is probably where things have changed. Now we're going to sound like an old bastard because before social media was around, you know, we crossed paths at shows. If we were if we did well enough, we might. Go be able to run down and go to the news agency and pick up a magazine and find a little little photo this big of us and the and the results for the South Island bodybuilding champs, you know. Um, so that's where things have, have probably changed because you see a lot of people come into the bodybuildings these days and they, these days. What I have noticed, they do quite well. Especially some of the ones that do really well, they do really well. They sort of set themselves up. And then they sort of drift off, and they just got straight off into the into their coaching and bits and pieces. Yeah. Um, you know, rugby players, a good rugby player is going to play rugby from when they're five through to when they're, they're 30, 32 years old. So they're going to have a, a twenty five year span of playing rugby. I think people that probably like us who are very very passionate, we're going to do the same. Mm. Where I, I think you see a lot more people these days that in it, they go hard and fast for two or three years. And then they use that as, a, as leverage for their PT business or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk. Let's talk uh, pro career, Mike, because um, you've been on some stages with some some pretty phenomenal athletes, um, yes. and you've done some pretty cool shows. You want to tell us about yep. that? Yep. So um, I did my first show was the 2009 Tampa Pro, which was um, a pretty hefty one to jump in as my first one. Um, so um, I was up against I was like up against some big names. I mean. You know, Dennis James won that show. It was it was um, Ben Pikowski's first show. Um, it was Fouad. He got second, I think, cause, and 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 um, Ben Pikowski got third. There was Big Eddie Abu was in there. Um, Biggie Smalls. There was some. You, you know, there was some big names. Johnny Jackson was in there, and all that type of thing. Um, some heavy hitters some, there. Mm. What was that? Sorry. Some pretty heavy hitters there. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, Dennis is Dennis's last show from memory. Uh, he was his last one or might have been a second yeah. it might have been his last one mm. um, and then um, to be honest that show I reckon I probably came out the worst I've ever come out to be honest yeah. and I looked great coming into it um, at that particular time I was using a full ketogenic diet I'd been on keto, a keto diet for 12 months yeah. so I was training with Dave Palumbo, yeah. or Palumbo. Um, and I, I soon realised that things like ketogenic diets have their place but um, they have a place and we ran that right through and if you have a look at the photos from my first show which i absolutely hate um they're probably, like I said, they're probably the worst stage photos i've got um i was watery and smooth and i was I, then i had the dallas show the following week and i actually just went off what dave had given me and, and did my own thing and, and ended up coming in better yeah. definitely better but uh, the damage already been done so um so that was 2009 um i sort of came back from that pretty disgruntled to be honest and going I'm just this is just silly and I spent a ridiculous amount of money so I stepped away from the away from the the, the competing side of things for a while and that's about the same time that we decided to move to Australia so I did a bit of bit of fighting bit of Muay Thai and stuff which was really good and then when I was in Australia probably to try and help lift my uh, profile in Australia I jumped decided to do the 2014 Australian Pro, which was the last year before it became the Arnold's. Yep. Um, and that was a great show. And I really enjoyed that. And I really liked the way I looked in that show. Um, and that was, we were, you know, we had, um, oh, who did we have in that show? Geez, that was a real who's who. who of it. There was um, Sean Roden won it. Uh, Bonnet got second. Um, <laughs> who got third? Um Evan Senapani, um, Branch Warren was in it, um, David Henry was in it, Josh Nardowitz was in it. Um, yeah, so that was that was a big name. And look, I, I, put, I walked away at that show, I think, the 10th. Yeah. Um, you know, when you talk 10th, 9th, there was a few people who thought I should have come in and come in a place high, but I really enjoyed that show. That was that was just an amazing show. I just had a blast and I was so happy how I, how I came out on stage 
after five years I've been off the stage. Yeah. Um, I weighed in about on stage, I think I was about 101 kilos. So, you know, I was very happy with that and in good, good shape. Yeah. And I said to Tony Doherty after, I said, I'm going to go to New Zealand and do most 212 show. And he said, there is no way you're going to get under 212 from the weight you are at the moment. And um, yeah, I did. <laughs> Um, and and that was a show that I ended up standing on stage with Jose Raymond and of course yeah. some of the guys from New Zealand and um, uh, I can't remember the guy that got second actually was from Poland I think so yeah, yeah. so that was that was 2014 uh, 2015 off uh, was about competing again wasn't too sure I came over to see Steve win the nationals in yeah. 2015 uh, and Mo cornered me and said hey we're doing a two one two pro show next year. Um, I went home and said to the boss, oh, Mo's doing a 212 show. And she was like, the first thing she said to me was, oh, when do you start dieting? So um, so I did the 212. I was very, very happy with the way I come out in that show. And I know that was that show had a, had a, um, a bit of a, um, there was some heated discussion about the placings, that's for sure. Uh, not, not, you know, first was definitely Jose Raymond. I ended up walking away with third, but there was a pretty good discussion on yeah, some of those yeah. placings. Yeah. Um, and then uh, that was 2016, and then 2017, I went and did the New York uh, Pro uh, again, two one two, and the Toronto two one two. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I think Mike. I had a conversation with Mike about the Toronto one as well, and the and some and New York and the, some of the placings there, and felt you're a bit hard done by. Um, uh, yeah. Look, it's the sort of sport that you sort of if you you just have to roll with it. And look yeah. behind closed doors. I've talked about some of my, play well, actually, no, I'll be really honest. It's probably only one of my placings that I've ever really been strong opinioned of, um, but it was always behind closed doors. Yeah. I'm, never, I'm, you know, I'm never going to discuss the results in public because um, it's disrespectful to the other athletes. Yeah. Um, and I know how I looked at shows. And, and, and to be honest, for me, the placing, especially once I became a pro, was more about looking at those photos from last show to this show and did I get better? Yeah, you know, yeah. I think predominantly I did. New York was a bit of a nightmare for me, um, but that was the, to do with the travel and 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 so forth. Um, but in general, I've got to, I've, I've been happy with my progression over my years as a pro. So yeah. I, I probably think my favourite look, my favourite look would have been the Australian pro. Yep. Even though I wasn't probably my best conditioned, yep. and then probably the two New Zealand two one two shows, I condition wise, I was pretty happy with those shows. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Hey. Um, Probably you know, moving away from that because you, you know you've had some some amazing achievements here, and I just can't imagine sharing the stage with some of those people would just be my my absolute dream, even if I was not even in contention just to to be backstage and then that. So you know, massive experience here, but also you've had some really amazing results with some of your athletes, and you know you you've worked alongside or coached. Some, you know, you've worked very closely with Mike, you've worked with Steve Orton, um, a whole host of amateurs. Do you want to sort of talk us through a bit about your coaching and your ethos behind yeah. your coaching? Yeah, look, I think with, with the coaching, I take that. Coaching's a funny old thing, isn't it? Because sometimes you, sometimes things just work out so well and other times you, you think things work out so well, but the, the athlete might not. Um, you know, and I've, I've been really lucky. I think you, you can't create a, a, a silk purse out of a sow's ass. So, you know, the reality is um, you, as a coach, you're given a piece of clay and depending on what that piece of clay, how well it works, I suppose, but also what that piece of clay is, 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 um, is, is what you've got to work with. Now, someone like Steve, um, you know, I was just lucky enough that Steve, sort of fell on my lap in 2008 and, and we have a connection and we still have that connection and we're still close, you know? Um, and we did some really good things in the, in the start of his career. I took him through his first overall miss in New Zealand win in the in NABBA. Yep. Uh, yep. And then I moved and it was a little bit harder. A young Steve needed someone face to face. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so I've, I've worked with Steve. I worked with obviously with with um, with, with Mike Kingsnorth of recent, and and we did some great things there. We got top five in in a, in a pro show and a tough pro show, mm -hmm. yeah, in a Chicago pro show. Um, obviously, I was working with Kate there for for an extended period of time, and I, you know, made some really good. Felt that we made some really good headway on her physique, and I think we presented yeah. a very fine tuned, well tuned athlete. And her pro debut as well. So absolutely, um, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 
kudos to both yourself and Kate because that um, pro debut and, and in Mike's words is one of the best pro debuts that we've seen from a New Zealand athlete, you know? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was very pleased and you know, when your feedback comes back from the judges that you're probably a bit too well conditioned, I would rather <laughs> than say that than say you were too fat. So, um, and, and there was, you know, it was very hands-on. Obviously, I travelled to America with those guys, you know, so I made, the, made a bit of an investment as well to, to jump on a plane and, and travel to, you know, I had to take two weeks away from work and my wife and, yeah. and so forth. Um, and, you know, I was very hands-on. I was doing, you know, four check-ins a, a day with, with Kate. I'd check her first thing in the morning. I'd check her at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'd check her at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'd check her before she goes to bed. And um, I, I'd probably, you know, and I checked Mike a lot more because I'd wake up and he'd be standing half naked at the end of my bed saying, what do you think? What do you think? That's <laughs> my like, for, God's sake, for God's sake, Mike, just can I get up and have a piss first? You know, so... Um, and that, that was that was great. You know, that was a really good experience because um, you know Mike Kingsnorth is a is a has got a huge heart, and we're very 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 good friends. And as much as he can talk the ears off a donkey, um, you know oh. the guy's heart's in the right place. Absolutely, so, great guy, yeah. great guy. Can't speak highly enough of so, that. Yeah. So um, so I had good results with them. I had some really good results with um a couple of you know with people in Australia as well. So. I had a lot to do with um, some INBA athletes, which yep. is very big in Queensland. So I walked away with um, a number of um, figure titles, yep. bodybuilding titles with, with uh, natural athletes in, in those federations. Um, you know, I trained a girl to WB, uh, WBFF Pro and the Fitness Diva. Um, yep. I've trained, I trained another uh, young fella, Andreas, to... Um, the under eighty uh, under eighty Miss Open Mister Australia title a couple of years ago, um, and and you know multitude of both regional champions, both you know the classes, some overall champions and stuff like that as well. So yeah, so it, it's been really really good, um, and I've had some good success working with some fighters as well um, in uh, in um, in Australia, which is something that I do enjoy as well because it's sort of a bit of an interest in that, that I've got as well. Yeah, yeah, and that's that that could be a really good area because in New Zealand, um, what I've found is I sort of loosely follow, you know, fighting and jiu-jitsu, et cetera. And um, a lot of those guys, you know, while they're very, very well schooled in their, um, in their actual martial art, the training that runs alongside it, there's not a lot of knowledge, probably outside of a couple of key people in the country. So I guess if, yeah. if there's people in Christchurch that are, you know, into martial arts, et cetera, you know, you'd be a good person to touch base with. Yeah, look, I, um, I was doing some good strength and conditioning with, with some younger athletes and stuff like that. And then I ended up getting um, getting asked a lot to do people's cutting programs, that, yeah. which which I think is an, is an area that I think the old school fighters fall down on because they have that number set on their, on their weight and that is all they think about. Um, and, and performance is not, is not really, they don't think too much about the performance. You just got to make that weight. And if you got to, they have to make the weight because if they don't make the weight, they don't yeah. fight. Yeah. But I think, you know, how you can do that, starting their dot, their cuts a little bit earlier, um, you know, having them only, only a few pounds out from, from a, a fight weight. Yeah. You, you know, a week out rather than, you know, so that's sort of an area um, that I do really enjoy working to, and we've had some really good success as well. So the fighters um, do some, the fighters do some fairly drastic water cuts, don't they? Losing sort of eight pounds or so in a, in a couple of days. Yeah. And, and I think the, all, the ones that I've worked with, when I've thrown them, when I've put them on the plans that I've sort of just put, put together for them, they're a bit, Sometimes they're a bit like, oh, because it's a little bit foreign to what they've done before, you know. Um, you, Mike, you know, we've got way in at, at four o'clock in the afternoon, and you've got me the, the previous day still drinking five liters of fluid, you know. How much, you know, <coughs> and they get a bit shocked when you can when you can show them how how quickly you can you can um, adjust, you know, their their water levels and their weight with manipulation, not just basically drying them out and throwing them in saunas and, and so forth. And, um, and, and generally when I've, when, we, when I've done that, the, the fighters come away going, they've felt better than they've ever felt before um, walking into the ring, you know, must, so. 
some of the old school sort of cuts that they do and the drastic drops, you must sort yep. of feel like a bag of assholes by the time you hit the, you know, oh, and you, and you yeah, really absolutely. perform at your, at your, you know, 100%. So. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I, and I've been very, I've been very fortunate as well because I've been involved with, um, you know, my Muay Thai um, coach back in Christchurch, um, you know, the guy's seven times heavyweight champion. He's trained people with, with people like David Tua. You know, his, um, his, his school has a lot to do um, um, with a lot of the top MMA fighters are, uh, here in, in New Zealand at the moment. And there's uh, some people that he's involved with. And I've got a, a friend of mine, Sue Gully, and she was one of the highest paramedic. When you talk about paramedics, she was at the highest level of paramedics in, in New Zealand. Um, and she has a strong interest in, in doing that. And she's doing some PhD work. And she's a good friend of mine and a client of mine. So we are able to backwards and forwards. And one of the other people that I became very good friends with while I was in Australia um, was the head dietitian for the Wallabies back a few years ago. He works with a lot of Olympic athletes. Um, he, he, he competed himself and actually got me to do his last six weeks. But he's one of the, he's a PhD in dietetics and is a, a head lecturer at the University of Sunshine Coast. So I got to learn a lot around about those with those sort of people. So not just the, the bro science, actually got to learn a bit more of the, the actual science behind it. So who knows? That's, that's also an area that I'm, I'm, been very interested in diving deeper into it's very hard as a Kiwi to study in New Zealand uh, sorry in Australia so who knows you know when I get back here I'll, I'll have a look and you know I would like to have a little bit more I'd like to have a lot more to be honest of that um, that sort of training behind me yeah Dr. Debenham when you get your PhD <laughs> who knows who knows I don't think I'm that bright <laughs> you know about hard work though <laughs> yeah. hey Look, um, Mike, uh, just on, on that topic, if, if athletes want to get in contact with you because you're going to be touching down in Christchurch, do you know where you're going to be based or anything at this point? No, look, at this, at this point, I really don't. The, 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 the dynamics of the Christchurch fitness industry has trained, changed quite considerably since I left in 2011. There's a lot of gyms down there. Um, a lot of my bodybuilding stuff... Um, I don't really need to be at a gym for because the, the, the real honesty, in my opinion, is if I've got a, if I've got a bodybuilder who's going to be a good bodybuilder, yeah. they should know how to train. I don't need to lean over them. Maybe the odd session here and there, but the reality is it's the IP, it's the diet, it's the it's you know maybe the training structure, all those types of things, and and that I can do from wherever. But um, look, I will be basing myself somewhere. I'm just not really 100 percent sure. I'll get down to Christchurch. I'll go visit a few gyms. I've got a few appointments. I've had some fantastic offers for some from some friends yep. about going and working in their gym. Um, I've just got to make sure that the gym I do base myself out is going to be appropriate for my needs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how, how would, how would it, what would be the best way of athletes getting in contact with you um, if they wanted to? Probably uh, just via Facebook or, or Instagram. Um, you know, Mike D, um, Fitness and Contest Prep, um, or you just Mike Devon on, on, on Facebook is probably Sweet. the easiest way. Should we have a bit of a look at your Instagram anyway while we're, while we're talking Instagram? Okay. Let me bring that up. Be with me. Probably lots of pictures of dogs and cats and stuff like that. Yeah, that, that dog of yours looks like a, uh, looks a bit like a, a, a kangaroo, I reckon, in that photo. I found Which one? Cat. The Ewok. <laughs> Tell me that dog doesn't look like a kangaroo. Oh, that one? Yeah, Ollie. <laughs> yeah, he's half kangaroo. He's a cool dog. Oh, he's a cool God. dog. Right, I'll just uh, try and chop that one out, and I'll get rid of that. Right, so um, if you want to check out Mike's Instagram, Mike D Fitness and Comp Prep, um, there he is there. And I pulled a couple of photos up. Look at that. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, that first photo was taken about six weeks before my first ever show, so I think I just turned 19. Uh, yeah, it would have only been would have been like August or uh, August or July, um, two thousand and uh, sorry, nineteen ninety three. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a bit scary. And then that that one uh, there would have been I was getting ready for. Um, I think that might have been getting ready. For, uh, looking at the house, I must have been must have been getting ready for either the two thousand and sixteen or the two thousand and seventeen shows. Down by the background. Nice, nice, massive change, eh? That's the photo we were talking about earlier, isn't it? It is, it is. Yeah. I'm not too sure if I'm more impressed with the splits or the hair. 
Oh yeah, yeah. We were, <laughs> we were talking about here, and I, um, I, you know, you you were uh, working with someone over there that was doing that cosmetic pigment. pigment. That's actually my that's my wife. So oh. if you have a look there, that's all that's all tattooed because I'm actually yeah. without that, I would be bloody. They'll have the old monks monks hat going on. So that's my, that's what my wife that's what my wife does for a uh, does I for a job. Didn't didn't realise it was your wife. Cheeky so, plug there. So no no no. Well, I was actually saying to Mike, I said um, if I can find someone in New Zealand or someone locally, I'm going to get it done because mine's I've got the same. <laughs> so this fade yeah. out. Of it, look, it's, it's absolutely. It, it, in all honesty, I know this wee bit off track, but yeah. as you, as I got older, you know, losing my hair. And, and just looking older just you know gives you the shits you know and Absolutely. um and uh yeah that there most people think that i have a full head of hair and i just shave it for my um because that's how i like it where that i am actually bald all through there so yeah. um yeah so but julie's been doing it for like 17 years so book so. me in book me in julie i'm coming i'm shaking my head <laughs> quite, quite seriously yeah right so that, that's uh that's that, that uh, photo there is from the Australian um, Australian Pro. So Tony does this thing at the start, loves making a big show. Like the best shows you can ever compete in is one of yeah. Tony Doherty's shows. Um, and they bring all the pro athletes out. So they are all the pro bikini and figure girls and stuff standing behind us. Yeah. <clears throat> and obviously I'm standing beside Evan Senapani. Um, oh, and when you're standing beside Evan Senapani and you're looking down at his calves, <laughs> you're like, holy so yeah, he's a big, big unit, but the nicest guy, really nice guy. The fact, the fact that you can stand on stage next to someone like Evan and look like you should be on that stage is, is a real credit to yeah, the I, Pazuki, I, think was, you know? I think it was pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> I do like these photos because I, there's some of the photos, like I said, from my first pro shows, I look at and I just and I remember losing my shit back. Uh, after, not backstage, but afterwards in my hotel room, going, "What am I fucking doing here? This is ridiculous. I'm going home." Um, but I walked off that stage on such a high. Yeah, yeah I, rem I, rem I remember, you know, coming out from the auditorium and then some kids walking past wanting to get my photo taken. And, and I looked at those photos and I'm, I'm very proud of those photos. Yeah. Very proud of those. As you should be, bro. That was, they are, yeah, phenomenal. Like, <laughs> even sent to Pani. I'm big with, with Jose. Jose. So that was, uh, that's the, that would have been the 2004. 14, 212, I think, going by the backdrop. Uh, and, uh, yes, yeah, so <clears throat> that was with Jose. And, I, again, a couple of photos I'm, I'm pretty proud of. And Jose, again, really nice guy, very complimentary. Um, he actually, his wife took some photos. I can't remember if it was the show or the 2016 show and actually come up and he grabbed the fuck camera, ran over me and said, man, you kicked my ass in this pose. He said, then he goes, I got you and everything else though. <laughs> um, so yeah, I spent a little bit a, of time. I spent a little bit yeah. of time with Jose, and he is a he's a hell of a nice guy. Um, but yeah. you're looking at that photo. Um, you definitely got him on the legs in that photo. Um, yeah, he, he actually said to me, he said, "I think your side chest is better than mine." And I was like, oh, uh, uh, "Kudos, right?" And, uh, that and, that, the, yeah, and that's the 2016. So, um, just part of the part of the the quarter turns in yeah. 2016 and look I look at that photo there those photos there and I think it like, I, like I said I'm 46 now so these are four years ago I was you know I'm starting to get in my early 40s and I think when I looked at these photos I started to see the signs of, of the fact that I was just starting to get older and I probably I liked those couple of years prior to this I think I'm starting to notice a bit of size starting to go on the legs and the skin around the abdomen not as quite as good as I'd like it to be um, yeah and I think that's the, the that was probably at the point where I started to go you know I think I'm, I'm getting towards the end of my my bodybuilding career yeah just talking on that how how was the change I guess you know like I know that uh, you know you could put it together and compete on any amateur stage in New Zealand and still, you know, be it, be in it for the, for the win for the show. But, you know, at that, at that pro level, you know, you've got to either throw all or nothing at it. And you've, you've yep. got to the point now that you've went, mm, probably done enough. How have you managed to sort of fill that gap? Because, you know, it's kind of like, I, I spend a lot of time on my bodybuilding and that's still, and I'm, I'm, only a year younger than yourself but i know that it's coming there will be a day that you know i can't 
be a competitive bodybuilder anymore. And and I'm not sh- quite sure how I'm going to deal with that one. So how have you managed to sort of... Um, support, having good support around you is, was important. You know, me and my wife have a, a fantastic, um, very balanced uh, relationship. And I don't say that just because she's sitting sitting beside <laughs> me, but, but we, we really do. Um, and... Um, Look, it hasn't been that. It hasn't been easy. There's been bad days. Um, you know, when I sort of found out how bad my shoulder was, and ideally my shoulder's remedy is a shoulder replacement. Yeah. Um, I remember, you know, I, I'd been to the doctors. I'd been to the surgeon. The surgeon told me how bad it was. Um, I went and, you know, said to Julie, you know, let's catch up for a coffee. I think I got back from just got back from the, the surgeons in Brisbane or whatever. Um, and I sat at this calf and I just burst into tears. You know, like, because I just really knew that I couldn't, you know, and I've been battling with a, a crook, sh- bit of a crook shoulder for a few years, but I could get through it. And I just, I was at that point where I just couldn't do it anymore. You know, I just could not lift anything like what was required to be, continue being a bodybuilder. Yeah. Um, so a part of it was, was, I suppose, taken out of my hands. Yeah. Um, but I was already at that I was close to that point anyway. I was getting to that point where I was like, well, just one more, maybe one more. <laughs> so um, it would have, it was a lot better than if I were, if this had happened, if my shoulder had given up on me at 35 years old. Yeah. So I look, and, and as I said, I was looking at those photos that we just looked at then and I, I, I was starting to see where I think I was starting to go backwards. And I never really wanted to, I didn't want to be on a pro show, a pro stage yeah. looking like yeah. I was shouldn't have been there. And I suppose that goes back to when I say to people that are thinking about going pro, because if I put that, that physique up on stage in, a, in an over 40s category, yeah. it'd be fucking rap. Yeah, absolutely. You know? so, so I think that, 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 that's what it comes down to. Um, but it's been hard, but I, you know, my, my plan is when I get back to Christchurch, I'm going to get back into my Muay Thai, which um, doesn't aggravate my shoulder. Um, you know, I want to get back into a bit of mountain biking, which I used to do when I was younger. I've got right into riding motorbikes, um, and I want to get into some adventure riding. Have you got? Have you got a bike? Because you sold your bike in Aussie. Have you got a bike lined up in New Zealand, or are you going to be shopping when you get back? <sighs> well, funnily enough, my brother-in-law had bought a Hayabusa to take the motor out of it. He doesn't ride bikes, but he does. Um, used to be involved with rally car driving, so he yeah. he bought a Hayabusa just to take the motor out of it yeah. to build a cross car. And he said I could ride it, you know, if I insured it and registered, I could ride yeah. it until I got another bike. So he took it down to get a warrant for me last week. And he, he bought it for a steal. I won't say exactly what he bought it for. But um, the guy at the testing station said, this bike's too good to, to pull the motor out of it. So he offered him twice as much money as what he paid for it. Uh, so he, so- uh, he sold it. <laughs> so, so no, there's uh, no bike waiting for me in Christchurch. So uh, but no, I'll, I'll get back on a bike. But um, I'm going from riding sort of cruises and sports bikes. I'm going to go buy myself a, 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 an adventure bike and get into some adventure riding. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Well, we might um, pull, it, pull it for a wrap, um, but it's been really cool having you on, Mike. Um, really enjoyed the, the deja vu and some of the stuff that... Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I live on those memories, man. Those are like some of the most special times in my life. It's, it's funny because some of these, so I've been looking at the, all the results of the, you know, from the nationals and all the shows that are going on and sort of trying to, you know, I, had, I was talking to Mo the other day yeah. um, on the phone and, you know, some of these 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 shows that are going on and I, I'm really looking forward to getting back into the New Zealand bodybuilding scene and what that'll be. Like I've said to Mo, I'd love to get back up on, on, the, on the judging panel, whether that happens or not. Yeah. Um, you know, try and promote, continue promoting bodybuilding through the South Island, which, you know, I used to love, absolutely love doing before we moved to Australia. Yeah. But um, the scary thing is that a lot of these guys that are doing really well weren't even born when I started competing. <laughs> hey, and guess what? I was watching uh, Tournament of Champions on the weekend and I was sitting next to a young guy, Braden, And I said, oh, I said, your last name's McFarlane, eh? And I said, you're not related to um, Brian, eh? He goes, that's my that's my old man. And I said, I said, <laughs> I'll tell you this then. I said, the old man beat me at the pro am <laughs> and he fucking he burst into tears. He said, Really, really? And I said, and then you've got um the young I think it's Deanne Thin, you know. Yep. So, and so there's second generation bodybuilders mm. that we're sort of rubbing shoulders with, and yeah. I'm thinking, you know, I, I used to know your parents. <laughs> so, you know, it's kinda of cool. It's kinda of nice. It, yeah, it, it, it's funny because I suppose when I left when I 
left to go to, to Australia. Um, you know, I, I suppose within the bodybuilding realm of things, you know, most people knew who I was because I was yeah. either on the judging panel or running shows or still competing. Um, and then, you know, you move back after 10 years and no one knows who you are, except for the old people. Oh, I think you'd be surprised. I think you'd be surprised. Right on that note, the old people are going to go and get some. Uh, well past that, well past that yeah. bedtime. So Please all the very best. All the very best for the rest of isolation, and um, Jeez, when you get to Christchurch, we'll be in touch. Look forward to catching you. Take yeah, care, people. Mike. All right, team. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, guys. Bye.